Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Ab Haas, and with me here is Team 9614 Hyperion from Fremont, California. They have just been absolutely insane this entire season. They were the winning alliance captain at the Northern California Regional. They have consistently some of the highest scores we've seen currently at the World Championship. They're undefeated, I think, plus 100 TBP1, above 300 point average. I mean, I could go on and on. There is just so much going on with this robot. I can't wait to jump into it on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Okay guys, so I think for the past couple seasons, every year you guys come out with just a really effective, really fast robot. So talking about design strategy and just approach the game, what did that look like for you guys coming into center stage? Oh. Uh, basically, at the start of the season, we always uh, just at, right after kickoff, we always have meetings or more than multiple meetings actually that we always brainstorm at, and we have a big whiteboard that we uh, just draw all our all of our ideas on, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, gives give some suggestions from our very valuable mentors. Yeah, and so, you know, one specific thing about that is I know you guys coming into Worlds, you made a V2 robot. Now, I think the archetype is pretty similar to your version 1 robot, but the decision behind that is what I'm interested in. Like, if a team is looking to build a new robot for Worlds, what advice do you have for them? How do you make a decision like that? Yeah, so, I, of course, uh, we found some very critical flaws in our V1 robot, especially the outtake. Well, actually, technically, the V2 robot is just the V1 robot, but with a new outtake. Mm -hmm. That's basically the only thing we changed. So, uh, one of those decisions that motivated, or one of those reasons that motivated the change to V2 outtake was our inconsistent yellow pixel dropping as well as purple pixel dropping. So, with this extension outtake, we'd be able to uh, deposit the purple pixel without moving much, and that's a lot more consistent. Awesome, yeah. And so now, you know, let's just jump right into your intake. There's so much to go over with this robot. Walk us through the intake path and then we'll get into the specifics. Yeah, so on the intake, we have these, uh, these custom 3D printed TPU spinners and those along with a lot of different funnels. And what this does is it'll funnel all of the pixels into the magazine over here. So mm -hmm. uh, over here in the magazine, uh, we have the two pixels stacked together like this. And uh, this is just one of the special parts of our intake. Yeah, and so, you know, from an iteration perspective, was this like the first version of the intake you guys had, like, you know, one and done? Or what do you think were some of like the biggest iterations you made that really impacted the effectiveness of how you guys intake pixels? Yeah, so the overall shape of this intake was our, is still the V1 version. Mm -hmm. uh, we've only made very minor changes like uh, funnel shapes and uh, like very minor millimeter adjustments just to really optimize the intake. Sure, and so from the TPU rollers, was this like the first design you guys went with? I mean, I know the vast majority of teams out there, they just use uh, typical just surgical tubing. It's a cylinder the whole way, but this is definitely a very different and looks like optimized profile. So what's uh, going on there? Yeah, so uh, to begin the season, we used uh, something a kind of modified open flap or no, not open flap. Uh, I believe it's, wait, it is open. Okay, I'm not sure, but it's the one that ha also has a PETG core, mm -hmm. but those were press fit and uh, we found that those press fits would often strip or uh, be difficult to replace. So sure. we moved on to these clamping cores. Mm -hmm. And then the TPU portion, uh, we started off with kind of two parallel uh, two parallel beams. I believe there is in our portfolio somewhere uh, a picture of our V1. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not those though. Yeah. But uh, these ones we moved on to uh, this kind of spinner because they were simpler to print and yeah, just overall a lot more modular. And, yeah, I know that that makes a ton of sense. And so now from like a transfer perspective, I mean, obviously you guys could choose to put the pixels into your robot, whatever orientation you want. I think stacking them and then kind of at an angle is pretty unique. I haven't seen many other teams do that. So what drove that decision? 
Yeah, so to, we drove, that decision was driven by the fact that we wanted the outtake to be uh, as simple as possible, or at least the transfer mechanism to be as simple as possible. So when the pixels are stacked at a 60 degree angle right here, that means we don't need any, uh, I believe it's pitch adjustment. And so that means that the outtake can just come in and the claw can directly grab it, raise up with the vertical, angled vertical sides and mm -hmm. extend out without any other complex uh, degrees of freedom. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And can we see uh, how a pixel gets taken into the robot and ends up in that 60 degree uh, pitched orientation? All right, so here uh, we have the spinning intake and the pixels will come in like that. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. And, you know, from a sensors and program perspective, I mean, I noticed that the intake immediately shut off and we saw a bunch of lights uh, change color. So what sensors are you guys using there and what's the programming going on behind that? Yeah, so inside the intake magazine right here, we have a REV color sensor. And uh, the color sensor by REV is also a distance sensor. So we use the distance sensor aspect to check how many pixels are in here. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there's one pixel, it might, rip, uh, if there's zero pixels, it might, uh, record a longer distance than if there were two pixels, for example. Yeah, no, of course, you know, easy does it. And now going on to your transfer, you talked about how you pick up the pixels. And so now talking about your deposit, there is definitely a lot going on here. Let's start with your claw and then we'll kind of work our way backwards into the rest of the mechanisms. So go ahead and walk us through the claw and then we'll go on from there. Yep. So the claw over here, uh, it's a under actuated single servo claw, which means that it's using one servo to drive both claws. Uh, so the f outer the outer uh, claw right here is directly driven by the servo, but the inside uh, claw over here is sprung at a slight angle to the inner claw. So uh, kind of similar to Clueless's yeah uh, yeah. Claw. And so is this the design you've had like the entire season, or what did you before have a dual actuated claw and then decided to switch to something sim simpler? Yeah. So based on our transfer, this would or intake stacking pixel mechanism. Uh, we decided that this would be the most optimal uh, claw to be able to uh, drop the pixels quickly. Yeah, and, yeah come and, and so, you know, with, with a design like this, I mean, it seems like you have to drop them one at a time, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that something you've had difficulty with? Or like, you know, a lot of teams will be able to drop both pixels at the same time, but I mean, clearly it hasn't affected your scores. What was the decision to not have the ability to drop both pixels simultaneously? Yeah, so if we wanted to be able to drop both pixels at once, I think uh, this in this uh, stacked pixel would uh, configuration in the intake would uh, inherently be unable to do that because uh -huh. uh, we can't have both pixels touching the backdrop at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Of course. And now talking about the other degrees of freedom on your claw, I think I see some sort of pivot uh, over here, but you know, if there's any others, why don't you talk about them and then we'll continue. Yeah, so on the outtake or claw, uh, starting from here, there are two passive degrees of freedom. So their first one is a compressive, uh, wow, yeah, like that. And then this is able to uh, basically align the like the translational against the backdrop. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there is also rotational compliance over here. And is are those with just like normal extension and compression springs for the rotational compliance? Uh, rotational compliance is a normal extension spring. You can see underneath. Mm -hmm. And for the trans translational, it's a constant force spring, it looks like. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. And so again, is this something you've had the entire season or you kind of noticed that you had a need for it uh, after running some matches and going through some competitions? Yeah, so we've always had the translational mm -hmm. uh, compliance since uh, V1. But uh, of course, in some autonomouses, we found that having the rotational compliance would definitely help a lot better because we were dropping at an angle during autonomous. So mm -hmm. that's why we added the rotational during v2 yeah that, that makes a ton of sense and now i guess from going on to the rest of your arm i see this really awesome mechanism going on up here why don't you walk us through uh the mechanics behind it and then we'll go through some questions yeah so this is just a linkage to drive the horizontal sides and it's kind of similar to a double reverse four bar except it's just missing a last set of belt and this is pretty good at just converting the rotational motion into linear motion mm -hmm. and while staying very compact while it's uh, contracted. Yeah, and so from an actuator's perspective, you know, is it a motor driving? I mean, it doesn't look like it's a motor, but how many servos are you using to drive it? Things like that. Uh, can you go through that? Yep, so there's just two servos right here. Both of them are 45 kg servos. And that's just belted to the 
rotation over here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and one question I had coming back uh, to the translational degree of freedom you have here. With that Constant Force Spring, did you guys have to play around with different strengths or really was it kind of the first one you chose uh, gave you a good balance between pushing against the backdrop but also like not displacing other pixels on it? Yeah, so uh, this Constant Force Spring strength is just basically the uh, lightest possible strength that was able to overcome the friction in the linear rail. Okay. So, yeah. So because we wanted to hit the backdrop with as little force as possible. Yeah, of course. Now, going on to the angled slides uh, themselves, why don't you walk us through how they're powered, uh, and then we'll get into some of the programming. Yep. So over here, we have, uh, it's under this cover, but there are two uh, motors. They're belted to about 13.7 ratio. And then uh, those just, it's a simple, uh, string uh, linear slides. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple and definitely very effective. Now, from a controls and driver perspective, I mean, your guys' tally up is just so smooth every single match. You know, you guys have faced very little problems. What sort of automations, what sort of controls do you have so you can control all of uh, everything going on with your arm effectively? All right, so uh, in our tally up, we use um, button macros which allow us to perform multiple actions at the same time. So say instead of having to raise our uh, vertical extension to a specific height by pressing a button for a certain amount of time, instead we would have one single button press to configure both the vertical and horizontal extension mm -hmm. with one button press. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. Now, going on to your guys' endgame, I feel like with a lot of teams, we kind of uh, you know don't have to spend too much time on their endgame because it's pretty standard. But your guys' is anything but. I think the drone, you've taken a very unique approach to this season and it has paid dividends uh, for you guys, you know, just seeing it do zone one after zone one after zone one in matches. So walk us through what went there, what went on there. Did you guys try different designs or was this like the first thing uh, you guys tried? So this drone, uh, this drone launcher is uh, basically our V1 drone launcher. Uh, we've always thought that putting it on the outtake would be and raising it on the vertical extension would be uh, very would generally reduce the flight path and therefore be a lot more consistent. Uh, now this drone over here, it definitely took hundreds of iterations or actually test flights and uh, just several iterations to be able to perfect this drone. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, it just looks like a really complicated design. I don't think we'd have the time to get into it, but yeah, teams can definitely have uh, learn a lot from it. And so you guys just launch it normally, and then after that, you go straight to hanging. Now for your hanging, uh, wh what is the mechanism behind it? Then we can talk about some of the software as well. Yep, so hang is, uh, we have hang, the entire hang mechanism driven by a single motor. So well, the process for that is first, the motor reverses direction. And then there is a, uh, there is a secondary spool on here. Well, not spool, but uh, there will be. There's a hook uh, over around here. So this hook it pulls on a second string, and that second string uh, retracts this latch over here. So when this latch is retracted, uh, it should look something like this. And then mm -hmm. when the slash is retracted, it'll uh, it's and it unhooks the uh, hook climbing hooks from this standoff over here, and then uh, by pulling down on this slash, yeah. and after this is up, uh, this should actually be more upright. But uh, what we can then drive to the climbing truss and then retract this string via the by forward forward uh, motion of the motor, which drives the bigger spool. Yeah. And that pulls the whole thing down. Awesome, yeah. And I guess as we wrap up the interview, one thing that I've always wondered about this entire season is seeing your guys' robot. You definitely have the ability to package it however you want, but you made a conscious decision to be a little bit larger than that stage door, because I see you guys having to bump it out of the way every time. So what mechanism do you have to move it out of the way? And why did you guys decide to make your robot uh, as tall as it is? Yeah, so this uh, is a passive stage roll lifter. Uh, this is anti-friction tape on the top as well as a TPU cover to protect the stage door from damage. Uh, basically, it's just a very slight angled slope that slides under the stage door and passively lifts it up. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to have this to better be able to better package our slides, uh, because uh, we didn't want the slides to be too close to the floor 
or uh, anything that would be too complex. We we're more familiar with this kind of design. Awesome, yeah. And so Hyperion, as we wrap things up, I guess my last question for you guys is more about approaching worlds. You know, 10 qualification matches, unprecedented as far as uh, world's qualifications goes. So far, you guys are 6-0, and former matches tomorrow. Hopefully, they end with the same result. What was your strategy coming into worlds? What advice would you have to teams looking to perform at a similar level? Yeah, so as with all years, autonomous is uh, after a good autonomous, the game's already over, basically. So uh, what we really focused on was autonomous with this robot. Uh, that uh, that was also another major decision driving the extension in outtake, because we were able to drop white pixels uh, more consistently. So of course, with the consistent autonomous, and then uh, we also wanted to be consistent in everything else, as with like teleop and drone, and uh, therefore. Uh, we're able to get such high scores because of well, consistency. Yeah, no, I mean, I think if you watch back pretty much every top behind the bot, consistency is the number one thing teams say, and it's for a very good reason. But Hyperion, thank you guys so much. I, I have been so excited to see you guys play in person. Definitely have not been disappointed. You guys have been absolutely killing it on the playing field. I hope the rest of your matches go just as well. Reporting for First Updates now, I'm Abhas, and this is Team 9614 Hyperion. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.